All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our physics colloquia. Uh, I'm it's with great pleasure that I introduce Professor Samantha Lawler, who is joining us from uh, the uh, Ch Campion College at the University of Virginia. I think I got that right. Um, but before we begin, I wish to uh, acknowledge that Queen's University and the city of Kingston are on the ancestral lands of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee nations. Uh, personally, as a descendant of settlers, I'm very grateful to be able to live in these lands, but also recognize that there is still so much that needs to be done to understand the uh, historical role of colonialism and also the current institutional practices that affect Indigenous people today. Uh, I personally do want to do a lot more, and I would like to see physics do a lot more in uh, improving the uh, way that we teach and the way that we do our research. Uh, in addition to approving the way that we do our research, uh, this is a good uh, way to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Samantha Lawler. Uh, she completed her PhD at the University of British Columbia, uh, then went on to do a postdoc at the University of Victoria, and then received a very prestigious uh, Plaskett Fellowship uh, at the NRC Hertzberg before becoming a professor at uh, Campion College at the University of Regina. <laughs> Uh, today, she will not be speaking about her research. Her research is in planetary science in the Kuiper Belt. For anyone here who would like to speak to her about that, uh, she is more than happy to talk on those subjects. But today, she's going to talk about how our skies are being ruined by satellites and, and what we can do with it. So thank you very much, uh, Sam, for joining us today. Uh, and I would like to also remind all the graduate students who are on the call that you have an opportunity to meet with our wonderful speaker right after the colloquium. Uh, but uh, for now, I'm going to turn over to Sam. Thank you again for coming. We're, it's our pleasure to have you here, and we look forward to your talk. So uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for that great introduction. Um, and uh, let me just start by apologizing, because this is going to be an incredibly depressing talk. Um, so I, uh, I don't want to completely focus on the really depressing side of things. Um, so I have added to the title, um, what you can do about it, right? Because, uh, this future is not locked in. I'm going to talk about, uh, some of the, the scary, uh, uh, simulations that I've run for what the night sky is going to look like in the near future without any regulation, but this is not set in stone. So, um, okay. So, uh, Right, astronomy is one of the most ancient sciences. Um, people have been looking up at the sky, uh, noticing patterns and using those patterns to make predictions for as long as we've been human. I would argue that this is part of what makes us human. Uh, using the sky for predictions is, is fundamental to our humanity. Um, I uh, want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you from uh, Treaty 4 territory, the land of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis Mishif Nation, all of who have active cultural practice and strong cultural heritage associated with constellations and stargazing. Um, I'm a settler, so I am not qualified to tell these stories, but there's a lot of good resources to, to point uh, to. Point to. Um, there's, uh, in particular, this book uh, by Wilfred Buck is, is a fantastic collection of traditional knowledge um, about the sky and how the sky helps has helped people here on this land for thousands of years to know what to hunt, uh, what foods to look for, uh, stories about um, uh, just carrying uh, knowledge of the land and its traditions, right? Um, there's another really good resource here, uh, nativeskywatchers.com that, that um, talks about a, a whole bunch of, of different indigenous groups, um, including uh, sky charts, right? So again, this is this is part of part of our humanity is is uh, these patterns that we've had access to in the sky for as long as we've been human. Um, so our tools now have gotten a lot more sophisticated, right? Um, but we still have the same goals. Uh, we're looking for patterns and making predictions. Right now, those those predictions are about uh, 
exoplanets transiting distant stars or magnetic fields around a black hole in another galaxy or uh, asteroids that could come close to the Earth in the future, right? Uh, so we're still uh, using these predictions to avoid catastrophe, um, but now that catastrophe is uh, hazardous asteroids rather than uh, famine, right? Um, so uh, we're already uh, in danger of losing that connection to the sky, right? Uh, urban light pollution has been a problem for a very long time and it continues to get worse. 99% um, of people in the US and Europe and also Canada live under light polluted skies. Um, uh, and uh, there, has, there are many groups who are fighting this. Um, for example, the International Dark Sky Association, um, this is, uh, you know, showing how light pollution has increased across uh, the U.S. in uh, in the the last uh, few decades. Um, and there's been a huge leap in technology, LEDs, right? So LEDs are good because they produce more light with less energy, uh, but because they are cheap, they're massively overused. So light pollution has increased dramatically um, because of uh, this sudden leap in technology. So this is similar to what is about to happen with satellites. Um, Urban light pollution is escapable, right? Um, here in Canada, we're fortunate to have uh, a, a network of dark sky preserves that we can access, right? There are many of them in Ontario. Uh, I, I'm really fortunate here in Saskatchewan to have uh, access to Grasslands National Park, which has some of the darkest skies in North America. Um, and, uh, you know, we can, we can get away from the urban light pollution. The light pollution from satellites is going to be global. Um, so, uh, so my personal connection to this, um, so in 2019, I moved to a farm uh, that has Bortle 4 skies, so that means that there's a little bit of light pollution on the horizon, but it's pretty darn dark straight up. Um, so I'm within the light dome of the city of Regina, but I'm like way over here, so it's not so bad. Uh, I can see the Milky Way from my back door, which is incredible. I am so grateful for that. But because I have access to these dark skies, it's very easy for me to notice that the number of satellites is increasing. I can see it out my back door. Um, why is this happening? Um, so the biggest reason this is happening is uh, American private company SpaceX. They are launching batches of 60 satellites into low Earth orbit every two to three weeks. Um, I have to look up this number every time I give this talk uh, and update it. Uh, there's currently more than 1600 Starlink satellites in orbit. Um, uh, and uh, so, so this is the, the number of satellites in orbit over time, right? Going back to like one. <laughs> uh, and you can see that it is increasing dramatically in the last couple of years, right? Uh, this, this sharp upturn is almost entirely due to SpaceX. Um, right now, they, they control almost half of all active satellites. By the end of the year, they will have more than half of all active satellites if they continue launching at this rate. They have permission from the US federal agency, that's the only person, the only agency they have to get permission from, uh, to launch and operate 42,000 satellites, right? So right now, that, that's more than 10 times as many satellites as are currently in orbit by one company. Um, okay, so why why is this happening? Uh, these these are to provide global internet, right? And all of us, I'm sure, have experienced how vitally important this has been. Uh, having access, good internet access during the pandemic for work and for school, uh, like if you do not have good access to internet, you are left behind. You don't have safe options, right? So uh, so so this this uh, need, right? And there's many places, many rural and remote places that have been left behind by, uh, by uh, infrastructure development for decades. <laughs> so, so are, are lacking. Um, so a lot of people are jumping on this, right? Uh, having good internet anywhere in the world, that is, that is why this is doing so well. Um, 
So, uh, so this is a paper that came out last year that looked at, well, you know, there's a lot of, well, uh, uh, Starlink will bring internet to the entire world, right? But if you actually look at how much it costs um, and where the need is, right? So this is uh, how much the, the subscription costs versus uh, the GDP uh, per capita um, versus how many people in a country have access to the internet. Um, right, so the the part of this plot where you need internet and can afford it is over here, and there are no countries in this part of the plot, right? Um, so obviously, this is ignoring a lot of uh, a lot of issues, right? There's lots of people in rural and remote uh, U.S. and Canada who uh, would fall into this part of the plot. This is per country, but um, the the argument that this is for the whole world is unlikely it's not a charity spacex is a very profitable company they are doing this to make money so keep that in mind as we as we talk about this um okay so and it's not just spacex right spacex is the first and they have currently uh the most approved um but uh there are many other companies lined up to do the same thing including a couple of weeks ago uh rwanda um, filed uh, an application with the, the ITU for more than 300,000 satellites. And I don't know if this is a political move or what, but it's, uh, it's an interesting, uh, it'll be interesting to see if that gets approved or not. Okay, so why is this a problem to have so many satellites? Um, so for astronomy, the problem is that these satellites are very reflective. Right. Um, and uh, so we're 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 at a transition point here. Um, like it used to be interesting and exciting and new to see a satellite fly over. Right. Like I used to look up when is the space station going to fly over and go watch it. Right. That is really cool to see a little point of light moving across the sky and know that there's people inside it. That's that's really amazing. Right. Um, but uh, it's kind of like 100 years ago. Uh, if you saw a car driving down the road, that was a big deal. You'd get excited about it. But now you live next to the Trans-Canada Highway, right? Uh, we're about to have that transition. Um, there are no rules at all about um, satellite brightness. Uh, there's almost no rules about orbits or launches or anything else. It's really unregulated right now. Um, and so because there's no rules about brightness, satellites have, uh, sorry, the, the engineers who build these satellites have, um, have made no effort to make them any fainter. Um, okay, so how bright are they? So, uh, so I know a lot of you are not astronomers, uh, but I'm going to use magnitudes because I'm an astronomer, sorry. Uh, so, so this is a, a parent uh, V magnitude, so a visual magnitude. Um, so, uh, so what you need to know is anything uh, smaller than six and a half. So this part uh, is what you can see with your eyes. Um, and uh, so anything over here is kind of what you could see with your eyes from like a light polluted suburb, right? So, so more than half of these Starlink satellites are bright enough that they're very easy to see in the sky, even from a light polluted suburb. Um, so a lot of people complained about this initially, a lot of astronomers um, and SpaceX actually listened, sort of. Uh, so they they uh, they initially they tried um, basically painting one of the satellites black um, that actually caused it to overheat and fry itself. So that was no good. Um, so then they started adding. Uh, they retrofit their original design to have uh, uh, these visors, which um, which block some sunlight. And uh, I've heard a rumor that they're not going to have these uh, visors anymore, but I don't know if that's true or not. So uh, as of right now, at least as far as I know, they're still launching uh, with these, these visors. So these visors did make them significantly fainter. They did actually respond to pressure and make the satellites fainter. Um, so, uh, so remember that, uh, so, so the, the blue here is the, the visor sets, the one that have, right. So they're, they are much fainter, right. Um, so they, these are the, but still like half of them are, are naked eye visible from a dark place. Um, and, uh, this, this seventh magnitude. So, so that is where, um, 
they're so bright that they'll start to cause problems for very large telescopes. So, um, so Starlink has said that they will try to make their satellites fainter than seventh magnitude. Um, clearly from these observations, they have not done that yet. Um, okay, so, so this is what the satellites look like in a long time exposure, right? You have many of them flying in kind of a grid. So you get these, these uh, lines of uh, passing through your beautiful uh, astrophotography. Um, and uh, it's not very nice. Um, this, this happens to both um, amateur uh, astrophotographers and to uh, professional astronomers using, uh, you know, eight meter telescopes. Um, uh, it even happens in space. These are images from the Hubble Space Telescope that have uh, Starlink satellite trails passing through them. And you can see that, right, this is happening like pretty close by, right? So the, the satellites are, the trails are actually um, quite huge in, in these images. So to anyone who argues that uh, you can just, just send your telescopes into space, it's, it's fine. Like that doesn't actually help unless you get out of Earth orbit and that's adding another few billion dollars to your mission. Um, this is my data, right? So I normally study the Kuiper Belt. Um, so this is uh, images that I took um, at uh, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope. Um, so here's a few. Uh, so these are raw, raw images. So there's like there's funny little trails next to bright stars. The um, the vertical lines are all just image artifacts. The the lines that are not not vertical are our satellite trails right and this was i wasn't even trying to find these they're just they're just in my data Ugh. <laughs> so so the the kuiper belt objects that i'm searching for are are um d or g magnitude uh 25 this is about 15 million times fainter than a typical starlink right so so this is a serious problem um and and uh cfht is not a huge telescope it's going to be even more of a problem for a larger telescope with more sensitive instruments like the vera rubin telescope um okay so then when they're first launched these these starlink satellites they're very close together um, and they look weird. I haven't actually seen one yet, but I've heard from a lot of people um, that it looks like a line. Your eye actually can't resolve the individual satellites. So it looks like a line traveling across the sky. And uh, there was this whole New York Times article about like, UFO sightings have gone up so much during the pandemic, everyone's going crazy. It's actually Starlink. And this whole New York Times article did not even uh, did not even mention Starlink. But like, I personally have had so many people ask me about UFOs, and it turns out to be Starlink. Uh, so it like even people who don't look up at the sky are noticing this change already. Okay. So how bad could it get? Let's just find out. Um, so there is there is credible progress towards 65,000 satellites. That's um, uh, US uh, Starlink, US Kuiper, UK OneWeb, and China's uh, Guoang constellation. So, uh, so we have orbits for, for these that have been uh, asked for by these companies. Um, so this is what it would look like when you take these this many satellites, distribute them on the orbits that uh, these companies have asked for. Um, so this is just a snapshot of where they would be, right? Like the, the world map, you can't even see through it, right? So here's a zoom in over North America. Um, notice that there are these sort of higher density uh, caustics, I guess you could call them, right? This is just from the tilt of the orbits that have been decided. And one of these goes right over Southern Canada. Uh, so keep that in mind, we'll come back to that. Um, okay, so for optical, for radio astronomy, it just matters how many there are broadcasting over you radio astronomy is in serious trouble from this. Um, for optical astronomy, it depends, it matters uh, how many are sunlit. So how do we calculate that, right? So um, the, the shadow of the earth, right? So if you imagine the sun is off, off in this direction, uh, shining on these satellites, um, there's actually this big hole in the distribution where uh, the earth shadow is blocking sunlight from, from hitting the satellites. And of course, over here, it's daytime. So you're not going to be able to see them. So uh, so this is uh, latitude on the earth uh, versus time of day, right? So this is midnight, right? So, uh, and this is on the equinox, right? And so, so on the equinox, 
um, there's this big shadow from the Earth that makes it so you can't see uh, the satellites are, are not lit up by the sun for most of the night, right? Um, uh, and, but notice, uh, and uh, sorry, and this, these gray bits are where it's daytime, you can't see them. Um, notice the scale, right? The, so the color is telling you how many sunlit satellites there are above that latitude at that time of day or night. Um, this is thousands, right? So, so here's 40, uh, right? So thousands of sunlit satellites um, just after sunset and after sunrise. Um, so uh, here are, right? So observatories in Canada, so I'm saying 50 degrees, ish that's where most of the um the the canadian research observatories are in canada um here's the canary islands hawaii and observatories in chile right so just different latitudes where we have a lot of uh, astronomy research happening just uh for comparison so how does it look um we we can look at this um in a slightly different way so number of satellites versus time of night um right so on the equinox um, so everybody gets down to only a few hundred <laughs> illuminated satellites. Maybe you even get a period of time where there's no illuminated satellites at all above the horizon from your position. Um, on the June solstice, right, the summer solstice for us, um, in Canada, it doesn't even drop below 2,000 <laughs> sunlit satellites. Uh, in uh, other right, so then and at this in this is uh, southern winter. So observatories in Chile will have some period of time where there are no sunlit satellites, um, right? So so this is this is worrying, right? Um, but uh, okay, so the, now we know how many are sunlit. How many are actually uh, visible? Uh, so that depends on how much sunlight they reflect, right? And this is complicated uh, because it depends on the shape of the satellite, it depends on the materials, it depends on all this information that we don't have. So, so we assume a sphere because that's what physicists do. <laughs> so, um, uh, so I realize that this is a terrible approximation, right? Like uh, you might imagine like Sputnik, right? The, the original artificial satellite, it was a sphere, right? But Starlink satellites are not spheres, we know that. Um, but uh, we did try more complicated models and they didn't work any better. So we'll just stick with a sphere because we're physicists. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so this is, uh, the, the equation, right? So it looks terrible, but it's really just, it's the apparent magnitude of the sun, right? Um, and then a whole, but then some logarithms to make it be in magnitude space because that's what we astronomers like. Um, and then it depends on the phase angle, right? So the, the angle between the sun, you and the satellite, right? So how much, how much reflection is happening. Um, and then the distance between uh, you and the satellite. Um, and then one more variable here is the effective area. So this is what we're going to vary to try to try to um, get a good model here. Um, so albedo, which is how much sunlight the the um, it reflects, right? An albedo of one is like a mirror, an albedo of zero absorbs all light that comes onto it. Um, times the cross-sectional area. So it's like the effective area of the satellite. Um, okay, so now we need to calibrate our data to uh, cal calibrate our model to real data. Um, and we wanted this to be uh, specific to Canada. Um, so this was, uh, so uh, Aaron Boley, Hannah Ryan, and, uh, and myself, all Canadian astronomy professors, uh, we used, uh, so, so Aaron Boley led a project on the Plaskett Telescope in Victoria. Uh, so that we could get high latitude observations of these satellites in the summertime when it's the worst. So, uh, so let's calibrate our model to the worst possible case, uh, and and see how see see what happens. So, um, okay. So uh, we initially tried to just use the visor sets, but it turns out it's actually really hard to find out um, which ones are actually deployed. Like uh, it's it's uh, recent. Uh, published observations indicate that maybe not all of them actually have the risers out. Uh, so, so we just did all the Starlink satellites. So we, we observed all of the Starlink satellites that we could just one night, uh, one piece of sky, um, which there's so darn many of them that that's really easy to get a pretty decent uh, data set. So, um, so the, the blue is our, uh, our real observations in uh, magnitude. Um, 
And then uh, gray is our model, right? So our spherical model uh, with with uh, a random uh, half a half a magnitude uh, added in because that makes it match our data better, and that takes into account possibly not having the the uh, the visors deployed. Um, okay, so so we have our model now. We have our calibrated model. Um, oh, and and I just wanted to note that like most of these are still uh, well above naked eye visible, right? Uh, these these satellites are bright. Um, so our best fit um, corresponds to uh, an area of four meters squared uh, with an albedo of 0.2. So this is pretty reasonable for what we know about uh, Starlink satellites. So it all kind of it all hangs together. Um, okay, so now let's take this model and figure out how bad is it going to be for the rest of the world. Um, so uh, this is changing so fast, continuously. Like, uh, you know, this paper isn't even uh, fully accepted yet, and uh, Starlink has already changed which orbits they want to use. Uh, so uh, this is, you know, th this is an approximation, but um, it's it's a pretty good approximation. Um, papers from a year ago are completely out of date already. Um, <clears throat> okay, so uh, so here's we we have our our model, our calibrated model. We don't know, so we're only uh, calibrating two Starlink satellites. Uh, are other companies going to do a better job of making their satellites fainter or a worse job? We don't know. We don't know if this is pessimistic or optimistic. So we're just gonna use this because this is what we have right now. Um, here are all the orbits that we use. These are the, the orbits that these companies have asked for or had asked for as of the time that we wrote the paper. Um, and we used uh, Rebound, uh, the, the open source end body integrator, which Hannah Ryan is one of the authors of. Um, <clears throat> all of our code is open source. It's on Hano's GitHub page. Um, uh, there's also a, a simple web app that you can you can play around with. Find you know, plug in your position on the Earth and uh, and find out and the time of year and find out how many satellites will be visible um, above your head. <clears throat> so that's what we did in this paper uh, in a little bit more uh, more detail. So uh, so this is Hawaii, right? Uh, I I use telescopes in Hawaii. Many of us many of us astronomers use telescopes in Hawaii. Um, so this is, uh, I'm going to show a few of these. So this is different seasons, right? Winter solstice, equinox, summer solstice. Uh, this is uh, evening, dusk, midnight, and morning, uh, dawn, right? So uh, so this, and then the, uh, the dots are the brightness of the satellites. Um, so remember, six and a half is, is visible. So anything that's Kind of orange or yellow is is naked eye visible. Um, you've also got a number here. So the total number of sunlit satellites in the sky and the uh, the number that's visible. Um, so I've also done this as a movie. Um, so this is on the summer solstice. So this is the worst. <laughs> uh, and so here's the time. Here's the number of visible satellites in the sky, right? So you can see that in, in Hawaii, you're going to get down to, um, by 10 p.m., you get down to no visible satellites. And uh, there are a few hundred satellites in, that are sunlit and in the night sky that could interfere with your observations, but they're below 30 degrees altitude. So that's not where you're going to be pointing your telescope anyway. So even on the worst days, uh, Hawaii is okay, right? Like it's gonna impact how much time there is in the night, right? Uh, you're gonna have bright satellites to deal with as you get close to dawn and dusk. Um, close this, okay. So uh, so, can so I said Canada being 50 degrees because that's where I live. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so this is the worst latitude on the whole planet. <laughs> if you go further north, there's not quite as many satellites. Um, and also you don't really get much darkness in the summer. Uh, so in the summertime from here, uh, we are going to have hundreds of visible satellites all night long. Uh, which is really crappy. I'm not happy about this. Uh, so, so even even as we get to midnight, and you can see they're all straight up. The ones that are visible, it's not even like they're around the the edge of the horizon. They're straight up. <laughs> they're bright, like you know, bright enough to see from the sun, su uh, light polluted suburbs. Um, so this is, uh, this is crappy. Um, so I did one for you guys in Kingston, uh, 
latitude 44 is not quite as bad as latitude 50. Um, if anyone wants to see the Equinox movies, I can show those maybe in the uh, question time. Um, but so, so here's, here's what your night sky is gonna look like at latitude 44 degrees north. Um, so you can see that uh, by, by, this is on the summer solstice, so this is the worst. Um, so you can see that it's not quite as bad, right? Um, you've got a few dozen that are visible all night long, but, um, <clears throat> but it gets down to a lower number than, than at latitude 50. And then it, it climbs again as you get closer to dawn and, cl uh, and, and closer to, you know, closer to the, the end and the beginning of the night. Um, and even if you go to the North Pole, there are sunlit satellites in the sky. Um, and you know, of course, there's no, uh, no darkness in the summer. So I just did, we just did uh, simulations for uh, different solar altitudes, right? So the winter solstice. So, so there will be you know, a few satellites visible all day and all night, right? Because it's dark all the time. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's just just pointing out that like this is truly global. There is nowhere in the world that you can go and get away from this satellite light pollution. Okay, so uh, so what about what can can we change their altitudes? Can we change the satellites uh, altitudes somehow? Have them do different orbits? Um, so SatCon one and SatCon two, uh, these were. Um, uh, conferences between uh, astronomers, space lawyers, which is a, a thing, uh, and uh, industry a little bit uh, to talk about um, what, how can we not completely destroy the night sky? At least that was the, the goal for the astronomers. Um, so, uh, so one of the recommendations was to actually bring the satellites down to lower orbit. So for research telescopes, this is better because even though they're brighter when they're closer, um, they are moving faster, right? Kepler's laws, right? You go to a lower orbit, you have a faster orbital period. So they're moving across the sky faster, um, which means that if you have you know, your field of view on the sky, they're gonna move through your field of view faster, which means that they're depositing their light across more pixels and causing less damage to your image. But does that actually uh, does that actually make things better for the whole world? Um, so okay, so this is a lot a lot of information here. But um, so this is uh, these this part of the plot is all midnight. This part of the plot is all nautical dusk, so beginning of the night. Um, and I've done a, we've done a toy model here with um, two different altitudes, so 550 kilometers, which is where most of the Starlinks are now, and 1,200 kilometers, which is where OneWeb is planning to operate. Um, so I just took the exact same orbits, but changed the altitudes to see what does that actually do to the visibilities, right? And so, um, so the uh, 550 kilometers, right? Like they are brighter. Like you can see that there's more yellow um, than the 1200 kilometer one. Uh, but and there are there are more of them that are visible um, at the beginning of the night. Uh, but you can see that it drops off faster. Um, as you go toward the equator. So this is also better for most research telescopes because most research telescopes are in Hawaii or Chile or the Canary Islands, right? Uh, so, so having the light pollution be uh, less, less of a problem at uh, lower, sorry, I didn't point this out. This is the, the uh, latitude, right? So equator 10 degrees up to 50 degrees north, right? So, so as you get closer to the equator, um, there is less time of a smaller fraction of the night that the satellites are visible for than if you're at higher altitudes, right? But it doesn't actually help at all <laughs> at latitude 50 degrees north, right? It's actually better for us if you're a naked eye observer at 50 degrees north, it's actually better to have the satellites on higher altitude orbits because um, they are fainter, right? There's, there's not as many that are naked eye visible. So uh, so there's not, there's not a, like the, the whole point of this is just to say, there's not a magic answer. You can't just move them to a different altitude and the problem goes away. Uh, it just shifts the problem to a different, uh, different group of people, a different, a different group of users of the night sky. Um, okay, so I mentioned how, so why latitude 50 degrees north is so, so much more effective is a combination of uh, the geometry of the sun and the geometry of the orbits that have been chosen. 
Um, so most, you know, a huge swath of Canada's population is now going to be living underneath this, uh, this higher density of satellites, right? And this also means that we're going to be exposed to uh, the, uh, the, any hazards from space junk, right? More stuff over our heads. Um, uh, and sorry, this is just showing the, the caustics, right? So, so just this is a choice that has been made by companies to try to reach the, the highest number of people. Um, okay, so low Earth orbit is getting crowded, right? So this is a plot from uh, Boley and Byers uh, showing the, num the cumulative number of objects in orbit uh, over time, right? Um, and so there's a few, there's uh, the total is blue uh, debris, so just junk is is green uh the actual payloads are in uh orange and rocket bodies so this is like when you uh leave a booster behind in orbit there's a lot of those up there too um so there's a few features in this that are uh worth pointing out um this was a uh, chinese anti-satellite test uh that produced a huge amount of debris in orbit uh, in 2007, right? You can see that. Um, <clears throat> this was from a collision between an active satellite and an inactive satellite. Um, and this is what we call new space. So this is where um, the, uh, the number of, uh, the, the amount of stuff in orbit ha has become dominated by private companies, not by governments um, that are launching. Um, Here's another way of looking at uh, the amount of stuff in orbit, right? So this is density uh, versus altitude, right? And so you, these, there's these spikes here um, that are, those are the shells of where, where Starlink and other SATCON companies are, are putting up their, uh, their mega constellations. Um, so, uh, so all this uh, this blue here is tracked debris, right? Um, so, so this is just what we can see. There's there's a lot more that's way tinier that we can't see, right? Like a fleck of paint almost punched a hole in one of the space shuttle windows once, right? Like everything is traveling at many kilometers per second relative to each other. Uh, so, so even tiny pieces of debris that you cannot see. Uh, but we can't see from the ground can cause serious damage. Um, and this debris is slowly spiraling inwards as it gets tiny bits of drag from the Earth's atmosphere. So this is going to cross all of these dense orbits. Um, and you know this brings us to the idea of Kessler syndrome, right? Um, or if you have a collision between two satellites that makes a bunch of debris that can destroy other satellites and make more debris. Um, I've, I've I read an interview with, uh, Professor Kessler, who came up with this idea, saying that we're we're already in the early stages of this. Even if we stopped launches now, the number of collisions would increase in low Earth orbit. Um, so here's a terrifying way to look at this. This is a website uh, from Mariba Ja, um, and uh, so it takes a minute to load because it's actually calculating in real time uh, conjunctions between satellites. Ooh, that's a good one, right? So you can watch this ticking in real time. This is actually showing you close encounters between all of the satellites in orbit, right? Like so, so everything in orbit is traveling at many kilometers per second relative to each other. So that's, you know, getting half a kilometer apart, but it's traveling at, you know, 10 kilometers per second. That's really a close call right there. Uh, that's going to happen in about uh, two minutes, right? So this is, and these, these close encounters are happening all the time. It's really quite terrifying. Um, and there's no regulation of this, none. Uh, so one of the most terrifying things for me from the SATCON conference was asking industry uh representatives about so what are your plans for when because all of these satellites are in such tightly packed orbits that they need to actively avoid each other um so what happens when we have a solar flare and your satellite goes into safe mode for a while they're like oh well it's just one we can avoid it like no 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 what if what if all of them do <laughs> what if half of your constellation is in safe mode for a couple of hours they have no plan for this no plan solar max is in three years um Another problem is the atmospheric pollution, right? So, so there's the pollution from launches, which is mostly mostly carbon uh, and uh, carbon dioxide and carbon soot that's being deposited in the upper atmosphere. Um, but there's another problem with uh, so so Starlink is planning to only keep their satellites in orbit for five years, right? So this lets them 
uh, update and upgrade uh, and replace any failures, right? They're disposable. They're like your you know, consumer electronics. Um, so if you just run the numbers on this, right? They're planning to have 42,000 satellites. They're going to dispose of them and re, re send new ones every five years, right? If you do, just do the math on that, uh, each satellite is 260 kilograms. That comes to six tons of satellites that are going to be burned up in the atmosphere every day, six tons, right? So, so meteoroids, right, are, are constantly hitting the earth. It's something like 50 tons a day. But they're mostly silica, like silica, right? They're mostly rocks. Um, <clears throat> the satellites are mostly aluminum. Is that going to create alumina in the upper atmosphere? Um, right now, there's no uh, environmental uh, assessment that's needed uh, because low Earth orbit is not considered an environment, even though it is intimately connected to our atmosphere, right? So. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> is this going to change the albedo of the planet and change the temperature? We don't know. Nobody has run this calculation. Uh, SpaceX is just doing it. Uh, so that's really horrifying. Um, okay, so because of our, uh, because we're underneath this higher density, we're going to see more uh, uncontrolled re-entries. Um, uh, what happens if a rocket hits your house? Well, we have no idea legally what 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 will happen. Um, so this was uh, filmed from Vancouver. Um, I hope it's not too loud, right? So this is a rocket that a rocket body that's re-entering. Uh, right. So so this is going to become a lot more common. This was this was a SpaceX rocket that entered un uncontrolled. Um, a piece of it landed in, that was filmed from Vancouver, a piece of it landed up, landed in a farmer's field in Washington state and was recovered. Um, there was a lot of uh, news about the um, uh, Chinese uh, Long March uh, 5B re-entry uh, a, a few months ago, um, right? This is going to become a lot more common. <laughs> um, Right now, there's almost no laws about this. Um, the only laws that are on the books are uh, from, from the space race era. Um, and the only time it has ever been tested legally was uh, in the late 70s when uh, the Soviet Union uh, had a, a nuclear powered satellite that crashed into Canada into uh, northern Canada and sprayed nuclear waste across a huge swath of, of northern Canada. Um, and so there was uh, some legal action. The, the Soviet Union was supposed to warn Canada in advance. They did not because it was the Cold War. Um, eventually, they paid Canada some piddly amount of money for cleanup, but it was not like I don't have much confidence that this is going to hold up. Right. Um, these these rules were were made in a time when the governments were the only launchers of satellites. Did they even apply to private companies? We don't know. <laughs> right. This is going to be tested very soon, though. Um, OK, so uh, if we do not mitigate this problem, uh, what's going to happen? Right. The skies are changing right now. Uh, 60 new satellites every two to three weeks. Um, so the thing that makes me sad is we don't know what we'll miss, right? Um, so just to highlight a few things from my particular research, right? Um, there was a, a hundred kilometer uh, comet that was just discovered, right? A mega comet uh, that was discovered by the the uh, Dark Energy Survey, uh, and and like we would have we could have missed that, right? Like this is the biggest comet that has ever been been found in human history, uh, and we could have missed it. Um, uh, the uh, the Vera Rubin telescope is supposed to find maybe dozens of interstellar asteroids and comets. Um, are we actually going to find them now? Is it going to get too hard with so much? Um, the Vera Rubin telescope has projected they're going to lose about 30% of their images to, to satellites, uh, satellite streaks. Um, and what about planet nine? <laughs> Come on. That's like, that's my, my thing. Like, uh, I don't really believe that it exists. That's another talk, but, but I want to find out like what, what's up with the clustering, what's up with those distant orbits, right? We're not going to be able to get good data if we have to fight through these, these, uh, satellite streaks. Um, but the one that's really scary is potentially hazardous asteroids, right? Um, if we find uh, a potentially hazardous asteroid far enough in advance, uh, we can change its orbit or maybe just evacuate a city, right? Like the Chelyabinsk uh, 
um, meteorite that that um, blew out windows in in uh, a Russian city a few years ago uh, could have could have evacuated possibly right like so um, a slightly bigger one could have caused a lot more damage. Um, you know we're we're like orbiting through the sea of of near earth asteroids it's like it's like you're driving down the highway <laughs> through a herd of deer and your windshield's getting dirtier and dirtier <laughs> with bug splats right that's what we're doing to ourselves uh we're making it harder to see these these asteroids that we're orbiting through um okay so Astronomers are already doing a lot to try to fight this. A lot of us, uh, so so we're working on um, uh, trail re removal software, right? So so it's not perfect, right? Like you're not going to get that data back from from where that satellite streaks through your image. Uh, someone, Mariva Jaw described it as like chemotherapy for your images, right? So uh, your image isn't dead, but it's uh, it's uh, not uh, it, not ideal, right? Um, there's uh we can we're trying to build better databases for pointing your telescope and missing the the satellites this is computationally intensive as is trail removal um trying to observe the satellites on purpose to make sure that they're actually as faint as companies are claiming making sure that they're uh they, their uh, position actually matches what the company said. Uh, and so all of these things require money, right? This is taking time away from research <laughs> to, to deal with this, this, uh, this problem that has been made by private companies. Um, and so that is a real, real uh, issue for, for astronomy. Um, <clears throat> So far, uh, astronomers have been continuing to respectfully engage with satellite operators and hope that they listen. Uh, so far, they have at least pretended to listen to us. I don't, I, they don't have to, they can walk away at any time. There is literally nothing that makes them listen to us. So it's, it's not the best strategy. Um, uh, I talked about, yes, yeah, SATCON 2, there was also a dark and quiet skies uh, meeting uh, that's drafting a UN report that will take years to be adopted. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, SpaceX will have thousands, tens of thousands of satellites. Um, Aaron Boley and I had a consultation with the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, where a whole bunch of people from a lot of different branches of Canadian government actually listen to us, give a presentation on this. Uh, will they do anything? I, I don't know. Does it matter? <laughs> like it's only one country. Canada is not a launching country, right? Uh, so I, Canada can't do this alone. Uh, it has to be international. So what can you do? Um, well, uh, so these giant powerful companies uh, will only respond to legislation, which is going to take a really long time, and consumer pressure. We are all consumers. <laughs> Tell people what is happening, right? Uh, if you have alternate, I know not everyone is privileged to have an alternate. Um, don't use satellite internet. Do not buy Starlink, right? Um, they are not respectful of the night sky and they're not listening to astronomers. Uh, tell people, right? Like if you do have to use it, tell them <laughs> that you want them to make their satellites fainter. Um, tell people that this is happening. Tell your government, right? Tell your government representatives to support other ways of getting internet to people, right? I'm on a cell tower network here. Uh, I live quite a ways out from the city. That is the very viable option in a lot of places that requires a lot less damaging infrastructure than satellites. Um, those of you who are astronomers, uh, use your skills and training to show people the night sky, show them how beautiful it is so that they will regret losing it, right? A lot of people don't get outside and see how beautiful the sky is. So that's, that's uh, my homework for everyone here. Go outside and look at the sky and enjoy it, please. Um, so uh, just to end here, uh, couple of quotes from the SATCON reports. Um, if there are 100,000 low Earth uh, orbit satellites, uh, no combination of mitigations will, will uh, get us around this, right? Um, this will completely impact astronomy. It won't make it impossible, but it'll make it much harder. We're going to miss a lot. Um, we are on the threshold of fundamentally changing a natural resource that since our earliest ancestors has been a source of wonder, storytelling, discovery, and understanding of ourselves and our origins. We transform that at our peril. That's where we are right now. 
Uh, so we need to, to protect the sky for cultural and traditional knowledge, navigation, uh, true darkness, which affects not just us, but uh, many other life forms, uh, and the science opportunities, right? Um, this, this change is happening worldwide, whether or not people can access the, the uh, services that are offered, and without consultation to anyone, really. Uh, but like we shouldn't have to choose between astronomy and global internet, right? Like there's alternatives. With better engineering, these satellites could be darker. Uh, with cooperation between satellite companies, we can have fewer of them. So with that, we can maybe still have both and still have some kind of satellite that, that are not completely destroying night sky, but we're going to have to really fight hard for it. So um so with that uh thank you all for listening i'm sorry that was so terribly depressing but please go out and fight <laughs> this is this is uh happening right now thanks okay thank you i'm just gonna applaud on behalf of everyone because of course you know we can't actually uh have the the full applause from everyone uh uh, happening. Uh, so we were seeing a lot of applauses. We're getting some in the chat. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to stop recording so that we can begin questions.